Cleve Edmonston grew up in Walthamstow, East 17. The house he was born in is still here, but the area has changed a lot. In the 1960s, Cleve would spend his days trying to outwit the police and waterboard men by bagging a rabbit, mallard or pigeon just a few minutes walk away from the busy London streets. He's just had his first book published. Sorry, he's just had his first Captain Cook published. Tales of a London Poacher. It takes the reader back to the East End in the 1960s when carrying a shotgun down the street out of its slip wouldn't earn a second glance, never mind a helicopter and a chat with CO19. This map in the front of the book shows the haunts he and his friends used to explore. Areas of scrubland behind the allotments were known to the teenagers as the jungle. The Walthamstow marshes were an adventure playground where a poacher could practice his fieldcraft, making sure he remained invisible to the quarry and the old bill. Closest to home were the Walthamstow reservoirs. They're very much as Cleve remembers, except they're now a nature reserve and one has been turned into filtration beds for London's water. There's a couple of bits that we are referred to in the book. On this far bank of number five, it slopes down quite dramatically the other side. And I was over one night um, trying to poach surface feeders, mallards, with a, a nine millimeter Anschutz bolt action shotgun, otherwise known as a garden gun. And one of the little tricks that you could get up to was to empty the lead shot out of the shell, crimp up air gun pellets, and you could get about six air gun pellets inside the shell. And then it, the idea was to creep over the edge of the banking and if there was any mallards feeding on, on weed, you could squeeze one little shot off um, before they took flight or whatever. And you might end up with a, with a nice big fat mallard. And I clicked off a shot over here on this corner. Um, it made this, a crack like a little two-two. And lights went on absolutely everywhere. And further down Sandy Alley, there was... Um, gates that were open and there was a police car sitting there waiting and just like something out of heartbeat there was two people, two um, policemen on what, what was known as noddy bikes and they started to figure of eight around these reservoirs um, in search of me. Now I don't know whether I'd become complacent and sort of shot this area too much um, but anyway these guys didn't give up, they chased me for two and a half hours. I had nowhere really to sort of um, to hide because as you can see it's quite short grass on a reservoir so I actually ended up diving into the long grass where the, the um, tractors couldn't get beneath that pylon in the distance. Um, and I laid there while the headlights of these um, so-called noddy bikes or Veloset actually sort of shone through the grass but failed to detect me. Um, two and a half hours later, I ended up getting over the far end of number four there's a railway line and actually drop into the pavement in uh, Forest Road um, whereby I caught a bus back home leaving the police still searching for me on Walthamstow Reservoirs. It's quite exciting. Cleve was introduced to shooting and fishing as a boy by the older brother of a friend from school. His love of field sports has stayed with him through his life. He now shoots over a couple of golf courses, keeping down muntjac numbers and shooting foxes and nuns and habits, rabbits. The reason he wrote the book was to make sure his children knew a bit about their dad. Cleve wishes he'd known more about his father. When his son read the book, he suggested Cleve got it published. The marshes were a hive of activity for Cleve and his friends. It was better than taking a Jane Fonda wander round the supermarket when he wanted to fill the pot. There was a guy known as Black Powder Pete, um, and we, we nicknamed him Black Powder Pete because he only fired black powder shells. So that if you can imagine, he had tall grasses and he'd be crouched in the grass, and you saw this plume of white smoke go up, and you thought, ah, oh, that's where Pete is, because it was Black Powder Pete using these black powder cartridges. Um, there was another guy, Albie, Albie C., um, looks a bit like a gnome, he had a short, stocky guy, dead straight nose and kind of little beady eyes um, and he couldn't see a hand in front of his face. But there again he could spot and tell the difference between a, a, a feral pigeon and a wood pigeon, you know, further than what you could actually see the pigeon. And say, so, well, hold back guys, it's a, you know, we won't shoot this, it's a street pigeon or it's a racing pigeon. 
and everybody would relax. And then when it got into rain, no, it's a, it's a wood pigeon, you can't shoot it. Um, yeah, there was, there was all characters. Um, there was a guy, Jimmy, Jimmy B, I'm calling him Jimmy B. Again, powerfully built fella. He used to use a four bore muzzle loader, like a Davy Crockett kind of thing. And he used to fire something like two ounces of shot to, or two ounces of powder to four ounces of shot through this. Massive Davy Crockett kind of thing. Pour it down, he used to have the powder horn and the shot, ram it down. Um, and on a Sunday afternoon, we had this, I was on West Warwick with a friend of mine, and we saw this flash like lightning and this roll of thunder and this big column of smoke come across the sky. And about 45 minutes later, um, he's come back with a pair of duck and he'd actually downed two flying duck with one shot with this massive four bore muzzle loader. So, um, good times. It was, yeah, it was good times. Yeah, tell me, what, how does it make you thinking about it now? What was it like then and how, what's it like on reflection? Uh, on reflection, Maybe we're a bit too PC. Um, the biggest upset is the, uh, I keep coming back to it, it's a respect factor. If you know, it, if we did upset the waterboard guys in any way, if we were walking on, on waterboard property and the guy came round, he had no powers of arrest, even though he looked like a, a, a policeman. Um, you know, they dressed like policemen, they had our stations with them. But they had no powers of arrest, they had powers to hold you there if they, if they could or wanted to or, or whatever until the police turn up to arrest you. Um, but on seeing them, you respected them. They, they, you were over there poaching. No, no other word for it. You were over there illegally poaching, shooting, fishing or whatever. Um, these guys had a job to do. When they came along um, and told you to move or you sort of held their hands up, it was a fair cop, we're off. And we used to leave, you know, no harm done. After a hard day on the marshes, the boys would retire to the local Colonel Gaddafi cafe. We would bang away for a couple of hours and then go to the Woodland Cafe by the Lee Marina for a big Sunday fry-up breakfast. Again with guns and cartridge belts strewn all over the tables, quite openly, and wet dogs and muddy Wellington boots. Yet no one ever complained and no police were ever called and no trouble was ever caused. I lived for and loved those Sunday mornings. Another exciting bit of ground was the jungle lying in the shadow of Ash Mountain. And I was over here banging away on a Saturday evening and completely out of the blue, one guy was standing in front of me, both dressed in suits. And he's grabbed hold of my shotgun barrel, silly thing to do. He's pulled it, he said, I'll take that, son. And at the same time, another guy has appeared behind me and said that they were police and they arrested me. But then he couldn't find their way out, so they wanted me as their guide. So I took them, uh, let's say I took them the long way round. And two policemen in nice grey suits walking through this. It's not a pretty sight when they come out the other end. Anyway, <laughs> they charged me with uh, 14 charges altogether, ranging from shooting in the vicinity of children to breaking an entry. They're done with all kinds of stuff and I was quite nervy. So they took me up to the police station, they released me, and they said on the Wednesday, come back and we'll officially charge you. So I went back with my dad on the Wednesday evening. I was uh, respectable, suited and cleaned up. And I don't know what my dad said to this sergeant on the desk, but uh, he's gone up to the desk and I'm sitting there on a little wooden bench thinking I'm gonna go down for life. And I saw my dad sign for, for the equipment. The sergeant pushed me shotgun back, my cartridge belt, even the empty cartridges and we left the police station and no more was ever said. If you would like to get hold of Tales of a London Poacher go to www.anglebooks.com to order your copy.